Good evening. Um, I'd like to call the Tuesday, August 4th, 2023, Burlington Development Review Board agenda, uh, Development Review Board meeting to order. We have a quorum, and so we'll start proceeding. Uh, Vice Chair Caitlin, I think, is joining us, and, and Jeff Hand is, as well. You know, Jeff's unavailable tonight. I just remember that. So Caitlin, I think, is on her way. Um, we take uh, agenda items in the order that they're posted on our agenda. Uh, there's a sign-in sheet, so anybody who's here to speak on an item or wants to be heard or notified of it, please sign in to the sign-in sheet. That's over there. And I think all of the communications have been posted on our website, currently up to date. The and I'll swear people in as we go through agenda items, individual, uh, just be easier that way. So the first item on our agenda is public hearing ZP22640, 294-296 North Winooski Avenue. That's the request for a change of use from mixed use restaurant to bar. And we just, is anyone here to speak on that? No, you are? I was a concerned citizen. Okay. Um, well, we got a request from the applicant to defer the public hearing to a later date because of some uh, issues outside of the application concerning the property. They would like to get those resolved first. So uh, we don't have a date set yet for the deferral. Perhaps you're aware of what these other outside issues are. Um, I do. Part of it is I am I speaking for the present um, renters, but this is the middle of Ramadan, and people who would like to be here to address, and I think they did take consciously that they're religious observant people, and they're in the 10th hour of a fast right now. Okay. So I think there was an announcement that Ramadan goes to April 20th, and to be totally honest, at um, fast starts at 6.30 in the morning, and asking people to come in here and communicate with no um, water or food. Yeah, yes. that would be a very good reason, understood. Sure, yes. of course. So, I won't speak for either party. I was just uh, an interested friend of the okay. others. So um, that's what's happening. I so, just got the news when I came in here. Sure. The, the okay. Time, so that's all. That's my two cents and that's it. Fine. Sure. Um, you know, it's the applicant's project. I think we're generally all in favor of if they want to defer it, we'll defer it. Um, Mary, do we have to, we don't have to defer it to a date certain if they don't ask for one you don't have to but it has to be heard within six months all right uh, so I'll make a motion that on ZP 22640 we grant the applicants request and defer this to a later date within the next six months second. all in favor second aye okay great that's good so the next item on our agenda is ZP 2356, 326 College Street, Jan F. Holdings, Skip McClellan, Building and Parking Lot Improvements for Stormwater Collection slash Disposal, including demolition and replacement of accessory structure and replacement retaining walls. Is the applicant here? Would yeah. you want to come on up and take a seat? Is there anyone else here to speak on this agenda item? Okay, well, why don't you raise your right hand? Do you, what do you say? All of us. All of us. Yeah. Do you swear that the testimony you're about to give is true and the matter under consideration is true and correct under the pains and penalties of perjury? Yes. No? All right, so um, does someone want to take us through this project? I walked by it today. I have a good sense of where it is, but what do you got? You want me to do it? It's your call, whoever. Well, it's hard to see from the picture, but Hungerford Terrace is on the left side. Um, so we're adding a bunch of uh, underground retention, or not retention, but uh, infiltration basins. And then as you get towards the College Street end, it turns, runs up in front of the building again, all underground. What do you call those? Uh, uh, chambers infiltration. Those are, chambers. yeah, more chambers. 
right? So it's really designed just to pick up all of the stormwater for most of my properties on College Street and, uh, and a couple on South Willard. And the accessory structure that we're taking down <clears throat> is basically falling down anyways. The, the foundation is deteriorating, so. Hmm? Where's the structure? You can't really see it, but it's that dark uh, rectangle in the middle. And the stormwater needs to go under it. So uh, there's a bunch of utilities <coughs> under it that need to be replaced. And uh, so it just makes sense to tear it down. It's just a garage and a storage and space above. Wall that you're adding or something? In the retaining walls, yeah, uh, down <clears throat> at the end of um, the 326 College Street property next to 82 Hungerford Terrace, there's a retaining wall there's there. Retaining wall right here. Right. So we're going to replace that, and we're going to run another retaining wall all along Hungerford Terrace just to level the grade above the chambers. Is there a p plan you'd rather me show, Mark? I don't. I don't think there's I mean, one that's... like 17 uploads and they're various parts. Yeah, of the but I don't think, I think they're all smaller than that one. Um, so that retaining wall is just one waste block high, so it's, you know, maybe two feet out of the ground. Just so that I think we have a clear record on it, why do we need the retaining wall in that location? Uh, well, <clears throat> I want to do it for maintaining the building. Right now, the grade slopes <clears throat> you know, pretty good to the street or to the sidewalk. So when we run boom lifts down there, which we really have to do all the repairs with a boom lift, it's almost impossible. We end up having to brace them up, which is not say, really a safe thing to do. So just walk me through how does the retaining wall? We're going we're gonna to level the grade between the building and the So the sidewalk. retaining wall holds that level grade? Yeah, so you can get right. It. Right now it's a steep slope. It's hard to see it because it's, you know, there's some spirea that's, sort of overgrown in that area, so, but. It's called it has a granite retaining wall, is that right? That's what it says in the drawing. The, what we'll do is we'll use waste blocks and then, and then uh, cover them with granite. Yeah, there's, I think there's a picture in the plans that show, there's another piece that we did around the front of the building. And the, the garage shed you're taking down is not being replaced with anything? It's going to be replaced with the same, a little bit bigger structure than, than what's there, slightly bigger. But garages and then, a, and then the storage room on the second floor. Um, maybe, maybe you could bring that up, Mary. I'm trying to catch up to you here. You're going to yeah. <laughs> want to see the vertical retaining um, wall. There'll be a public room on the second floor for the tenants. Common space. There's your wall. That's the wall that's, that you, nobody can see, though. That's. That's between uh, 328 College Street and 91 in South right Willard. Right. Yeah, <clears throat> in, in the back. It's a retaining wall that's five feet away from 328. So there's another picture in there. <clears throat> Hang on, I gotta remember where I put it. So can I ask, Mary, can I ask you yes. a question on this permit? Yes. Is this for a just 326 College Street, or because of the way these properties interrelate, does this permit attach or run with the other properties? That, that is a good question. Um, this came in as 326 College, but it is among one, two, three, four parcels that will benefit from the stormwater improvement plan. Um, as one of the conditions, I've instructed Mark and his team that we need applications to uh, join this one to make sure we're covering all the parcels that are having stormwater improvements. So that includes 8789 South Willard, 9193 South Willard, um, 332 through 334 College, and 348 College, correct? Yeah. Plus 326, yeah. so that makes five parcels. Well, it's, it's 326, 328, 348 are all on one parcel. Okay. Yes. So. I mean, it's a, it is a comprehensive plan that covers half a block. Okay. Yeah, that, it's the only way to do it, really. But all that plan is part of this application. It, it, you have it in front of you. Yeah. There will be some porch changes for the South Willard Street properties, but they'll be included on those separate and discrete applications. Yeah, and, the, and all the applications are in. They are? So, yeah. Okay. Yeah, you have them all right, Mary. Yeah. 
can't approve them all at the same time. Huh? Well, I mean, most of the work is is going to be underground, and he's going to repave the parking lots and. Well, only them. this one needs to go to the DRB, though, right? The others. Only this one needs to go to the DRB because of those retaining walls, okay. in because of the setback. Two feet of a setback and. Um, one is already there, the Hungerford Terrace retaining both wall. Both are there. there. Yeah. And both. The, and the other one. Yeah, they're, they're both there, there, yeah. Okay. So it's a lot of plans for a major project, which I don't think makes much of a wave. No, I mean, it actually reduces the waves, right? Yes. Bad yes. joke. Um, Good one. Any <laughs> further questions from the board? No. Um, all right, well, this was a public hearing, so with that, we'll close the public hearing. I suspect we'll vote on it, hopefully tonight. Um, it seems like a nice project, and it's good to see stormwater improvements. Hopefully it'll be affordable. <laughs> so, I asked, no one else votes. Oh, 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 oh. Yep. No one else. So, that's good. good. Yep. Enjoy your project. <clears throat> so I'll call. Yeah, you got four. It's tight. So the next item on our agenda is 98 Sunset Cliff Road, ZP 23-9. Um, I will call the hearing and swear people in, but I have to recuse myself. I found out one of my partners had provided some advice to one of the people involved here. I don't know who, but uh, I'll take no other action from that. So first, let me get, is the applicant here? Or applicants, attorneys? Yeah, come on up. So is there anybody else who wants to speak on this application? Okay, so if you all raise your right hand and and the applicant too, yes, you. Um, state that, do you swear that the testimony you're about to give under, in the matter under consideration is true and correct under the pains and penalties of perjury? All right, I will recuse myself, but let me set the stage. This was a uh, approved public hearing. We found out that, approved via a public hearing, we found out that the notice program that the city used was uh, inaccurate and that certain neighbors had not gotten notice by rule. We felt we were required to reopen it. We did, we set it for tonight, and now we're having the reopened hearing, and I will step out. Okay, well, I'd say one other thing, too. I think this is also the project where there was a stair that was on the adjacent property, and I believe that that's not on the adjacent property. Am I correct? I can actually that? clarify that, so right maybe, I'll, maybe I'll and jump right in. Can introduce yourself when you I will, speak? Yeah, so my name's Elizabeth Herman. I'm um, Lucy and Ki Wong's architect, and serving as the applicant here so um uh just a, a a correction really on the stair um so that stair is existing that is part of um the actually if the plan is up there i can point out the stair that we're talking about um there is right there there's a little white spot that appears to So just to give people a little idea of what's going on at the shoreline here, so there are a series of existing concrete retaining walls that we plan to leave in place. Um, uh, there, it, the only way now to get down to the lake is through a subterranean 50-foot tunnel that leads from the existing house. It's a little, little odd and not the most ideal way to get down to the lake. So what we're proposing is to um, is to have a set of stairs go down to a point where um, we land on one of those retaining areas and then just extend the stair from there. So the hand that you see here, um, actually, Rem, can you help me out with this? Um, yes, yeah, so, yeah, so this was actually removed to um, avoid any uh, um, issues because um, Currently, uh, you know, there's 
there's an existing stair that yeah that protrudes over uh, the property line. So that's what you saw in the previous plan, which looked like a new a proposed stair. So is going down the stairs, come down, turn left, go down the next flight of stairs, you get a landing, and then turn towards the lake. Can you just walk towards the lake there, or is there a drop? Uh, no, there would be a temporary uh, metal hinged stair that would to get you down because that's all concrete along the waterfront, isn't it? It is. Yeah. It it's is. existing. Yeah. So you have a, a there's going to be a stair to get you down onto that concrete landing, and that's not showing on this. Yeah, it's about two. F it would have to be about um, you know about 18 inches, you know, depending on the water level. Is that the only? Clarification or change from the previous submittal, or are there other changes from there's, what we? There's one other clarification I wanted to make, which is minor. Um, the uh, setback is actually 13 feet, not 14 feet, and that was clarified in a note that I posted on um, on the portal. Okay. Otherwise, no, no minor. Anything else that? You want to add it to, because obviously some people have something to say. So yeah, I thought I'd just just briefly uh, mention what the project involves. Um, so there's an existing home on the site that will be removed, um, and a proposed new home going in place. Um, I think one of the important things to mention is that the new home will be further from the lake, and we're trying to uh, do a lot of beautification and site work that improves the lake shore and creates a, a low mo zone between the house and the lake. Um, we do, like as I said, the existing retaining walls will be left in place to keep the shore from eroding. Um, and there's there's a really lovely um, landscape plan that is uh, also part of um, the application. Um, the uh, you know the house is a little bit bigger than the existing house, but it um, you know sits within the setbacks and um, is just pulled a, a bit further away from the lake than the existing home. Um, and other than that, I think um, this, is, this is the lakeshore side of the site plan. Um, the upper half shows some of the landscaping on the driveway side, the road side, and um, the pickleball court. Can you get the whole, as much on, much of this, that plan to show at one time, Mary? Just, I know it's going to be smaller, but great. That's, that's good. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, a little easier to see what's going on. So, um, anything else you want to add before we? No, I. Okay. And, one, and I'm Chris Roy. I'm uh, the uh, applicant's attorney, and they asked me to come here given some of the issues that have been raised by the appellants, and you guys don't want to hear from me so I'll keep this as as brief as possible the one thing that the Wongs really wanted me to emphasize here is that this is a residential project in a residential zone it's a permitted use um, and you know as is evidenced by the staff comments here there are certain dimensional and lot requirements that have to be met and as staff has laid out, they have been met. This is a very carefully and, and well-designed uh, project. And there really isn't anything in the zoning bylaws that would extend to regulating through the zoning process a recreational residential use like pickleball. Um, sometimes you might have subdivisions that deal with it in restrictive covenants or uh, uh, declarations. Um, you have some communities that have noise uh, within performance standards that are found in zoning. That's not the case in Burlington. You have a separate noise ordinance. And for a permitted use like this, um, noise isn't one of the issues. And that's evidenced by the fact that, you know, as staff pointed out, none of those provisions that needed to be satisfied um, relate to noise. Um, so at the end of the day, um, this really isn't a zoning issue, and, and I understand that the neighbors feel strongly about uh, a pickleball court, but at the end of the day, I think the city of Burlington has decided that 
things such as noise generated by recreational use is covered by the noise ordinance and not zoning. And uh, if there were any restrictions on use of the property, such as restrictive covenants and the like, that wouldn't be something for the DRB to worry about anyway. It's not within your purview and you probably have enough other things to handle that you don't need to start getting into, uh, into those matters. So I just wanted to, because I understand that people are gonna be here and make comments about the project. Um, and that's why they asked to reopen the hearing. But I did just want to, uh, on behalf of the Wongs, really sort of lay out how they had approached this and working with Liz, had really endeavored to come up with a project that would enhance the neighborhood and which they could be proud of. One other question I have, um, and that is, uh, it doesn't look like there's no lighting on this. Or is, it, is there lighting? No. Okay. Any other questions from the board for the applicant? This time? Okay, well, um, let's see, how should we do this? Uh, can we start at this side? Let's say somebody who feels they should go first. Uh, I want a neighbor. Okay. Yep, you want to give them a, a seat? <coughs> I thought um, yeah, AJ swore, AJ swore yeah. everybody in, I thought. And if you can introduce yourself as you speak. My name is Claudine Spar. We represent Bonnie Fair, Draper, and their opposition to the application. The staff gets one yep. too, that's uh, the most yeah, critical. Um, yeah. I also have an expert that is joining us via Zoom, um, so I don't know if there's a way to. That's for you. Who should we be looking for? Uh, Lance Willis is in the This is just being filed today, correct? That's correct. I sent that earlier today yeah. to, to Mr. Gustin. So Lance Willis has the ability to speak? He, he is our expert. I'd like to have him speak on this application, if that's okay. He, he has ability to speak, yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. Okay, thanks. Um, all right, so uh, as I mentioned, my name is Claudine Safar. I'm going to stand if that's okay. Thank you, uh, members of the board. Appreciate your attention in this matter. Appreciate you also rewarding this hearing and giving us the opportunity to speak on this application. So appreciate that. Um, so as I mentioned, I'm here uh, representing Ms. Farrow, and um, her property is directly adjacent to this project and, and less than 55 feet from this pickleball court which has been proposed. And we are not here opposing the residents. Um, we would not be here if we were talking about croquet and badminton. And so I appreciate that uh, pickleball is an interesting, uh, it's, it's an interesting pastime that I, when I was contacted by Ms. Farrell, I didn't frankly know anything about. I, I play tennis, but I had no idea that pickleball was as controversial an activity as it is. And I, I suspect, and I, maybe all of you are far more advanced than I am um, on this issue, but maybe the rest of you have no idea like I did that this is, this is a thing in the country. This is a, this is a huge thing. Uh, pickleball, and I will have uh, Mr. Willis speak on this in this issue because he is a doctor and an acoustical engineer and an expert in acoustics. This craze of pickleball has taken hold across the country and there has been a lot of acoustical testing that has resulted from pickleball and what they have discovered is that this noise, I don't know if, if you are familiar with pickleball, you'll know that the rackets are hard mallets. They sort of more represent a ping pong paddle in, in a larger surface area and the balls are hard plastic. So unlike a tennis ball, they make a, a popping sound. Um, and so what I've, what I've produced here for you, I respectfully you know, want to talk a little bit first about, oh, here we go, yep. So as you can see, this is, this is what a pickleball paddle looks like. It strikes this ball, which is a hard plastic ball, uh, which is more like a wiffle ball. And so the sound you get out of it is more of a pop. Um, and that popping sound is a repetitive popping sound that has been likened to the loading of a mortar. And so when you read through what I've provided you here today, you've got 
a letter and I want to talk a little bit about your regulations because I respectfully, I, I certainly respect uh, Attorney Roy and his analysis, but I respectfully disagree with how that integrates into your code of ordinances, uh, which I'll talk a little bit about. But what you have behind that is uh, Mr. Willis's CV. He'll introduce himself and speak to you on this issue in, in a minute. But then you have several uh, kind of case analyses, for lack of better word, that are going on across the country, which talk about where these issues have uh, taken hold. So, first, just starting briefly with your with your ordinance, um, we have a single family residence, and we have what someone is asking for uh, as as an accessory use, and. You have a definition in your ordinance of accessory use as something that's customarily incidental to a, re a residential use. And so, you know, I'd start with the premise that this is not customarily incidental. Perhaps we can look across the country and look at tennis courts that have been customarily incidental to residential uses, but pickleball is pretty new. And pickleball courts, you can't really look around most of your neighborhoods and find pickleball courts in people's backyards. And what we're discovering across the country is that there's a reason why these are not in residential neighborhoods, because they're incredibly loud um, and they're very disruptive. And they are so disruptive to people that they are causing uh, tremendous outcry from this consistent, constant, repetitive popping sound that actually penetrates the insides of residences. Um, so we would first you know, argue that this is not customarily incidental to residential uses. And it, it may be similar to the types of uh, listings that you have in, in your ordinance um, for, for tennis courts, but it's, it's not at all the same thing. It's really not at all the same thing. Um, then if you kind of go further and a little bit deeper into your regulations, section 51 G2 and 3 uh, concern residential uses. And that section of your ordinance very specifically provides that these accessory uses need to be reasonably necessary to conduct the principal use. And obviously, I'd argue having a pickleball court is not reasonably necessary. I think we can probably all agree that you can live in your residence and you don't really need a pickleball court in your backyard. It's really dissimilar from a garage or a shed or something like that where you need to store uh, your lawnmower and your snowblower and, and items like that next to you, that you use in your house on a regular basis. If you proceed on to E and F of that same section, you'll see that it talks about accessory uses that, that can be permitted if they don't result in the increase and extent of pre-existing nonconformities and more importantly, violations of the provisions of this ordinance. And so F also says the combination of uses on any given property shall meet all of the provisions of this ordinance. And so if you look further, you get to your noise ordinance. And that noise ordinance is, is what is really important here today because noise ordinances can't, you know, Burlington noise ordinance provides very specifically that you can't create a nuisance on your property. Uh, the general prohibition in 21-13B provides that it shall be unlawful for any person to make or cause or be made any loud noise or any loud or unreasonable noise. Noise shall be deemed to be unreasonable when it disturbs, injures, and endangers the peace and health of another or when it endangers the health, safety, and welfare of the community. So it's not just an individual person's standard, it's a community standard. Any such noise shall be considered to be a noise disturbance and a public nuisance. And I will, at this point, you know, I'd like to bring in uh, Dr. Willis to talk to you a little bit about what pickleball noise is, um, why he knows about it, and how he can educate you on this subject. Um, Lance, are you, are you around? Can you hear us? I'm here. Okay, I'm excellent. Here. Can you hear me? Excellent. Can, is it possible to, to get Mr. Willis up on the screen so that we can all see him? I think it's useful to know who you're talking to. Awesome. There we go. Okay. Perfect. Um, 
so you'll find behind the letter that I that I sent, you'll find uh, Dr. Willis's curriculum vitae that, that you'll see before you. Um, Lance, can you tell the board a little bit about uh, who you are, who you work can for? I, yeah. It's yeah. Be a long night. We, we have his resume. We believe his credentials. And you've got his resume in here, so we do. I don't, unless you think it's something vital that we should have here or not, too. Well, yeah, respectfully, I, I do. Um, Go ahead. That's because Mr. Mr. Willis is the seminal preeminent expert in the entire country on this very issue, and who would have known that there is a sound expert and on pickleball? That's what's in your... That is exactly what's in here, but I think it's really useful to understand what his background is. Uh, could you just give a brief overview, Lance, of what your background is and how you came to be the pickleball acoustics expert? Uh, sure. Yeah, so I'm the principal acoustical engineer for Spendarian and Willis Acoustics and Noise Control. Uh, that's a firm in Tucson, Arizona. Uh, we first uh, began consulting on pickleball issues uh, back in 2010. A, a community called Saddlebrooks, just north of Tucson, that was our first uh, experience with trying to mitigate uh, pickleball sound. And over the last uh, 13 years or so, we have uh, had a steady uh, uh, pro projects uh, where we've been working on pickleball site planning and also um, uh, working with uh, people living close to pickleball courts who have been impacted by the sound, uh, typically from uh, courts that were either sighted too close or there was no attempt to uh, mitigate the sound coming from the courts. And so, uh, Lance, can you describe a little bit about the acoustical testing that you have done uh, with pickleball courts so that they, uh, the board understands what the process is and how you measure that sound. Okay. We use a national standard. Uh, it's an ANSI standard, S12.9. Uh, part 4 of that standard gives a methodology for assessing this type of sound. Uh, what people tend to complain about is the popping sound that the paddles make. It's a highly impulsive sound. And we need to do a special type of analysis as outlined in the standard to get a representative assessment of what the community uh, impact is going to be from this uh, type of sound. Uh, and have you participated, I understand you not only participate in working for folks that are impacted by the sound, but you've also participated in preparing mitigation plans for this type of activity, is that correct? Yes, we uh, provide noise abatement plans for quite a few pickleball sites. Okay. And uh, you've been involved in actions where uh, pickleball neighboring property owners have brought actions against uh, folks that have constructed these pickleball courts. Is that correct? Yes, I've seen that a number of times. Okay. And can you tell the board a little bit about uh, as I understand it, there are several municipalities in the country that are now considering regulations concerning these types of courts with respect to residential land uses. Is that correct? I believe that's correct. There's one that I know of in Park City, Utah, that has passed a pickleball code amendment. Uh, that was last year. And I believe there are several others, although I'm not uh, directly involved with those. Okay. Um, and can you describe a little bit about, you talked a little bit about the standard for measuring uh, pickleball noise and how it's an impulsive noise. Can you explain what is the standard in, you, in the industry, in your professional opinion, for the siting of, of pickleball courts to residential uses? Well, there's no standard specifically for pickleball. However, this type of sound is covered in ANSI S12.9 Part 4 uh, in terms of assessing the annoyance of this uh, type of sound. And what is your, have you had an opportunity to review this particular application by the Wongs relative to Ms. Farrow's property? I have looked at the site plan and uh, I've looked at the, the setbacks for the, the pickleball courts. Okay. And 
can you talk a little bit about how close is this property to uh, Ms. Farrell's property line, or this use to Ms. Farrell's property line? Uh, it was within 55 feet, according to the drawings that I have. Okay. And did you have a, prof in your professional opinion, what, what, what conclusions did you come to with respect to that use that close to a property, a boundary line? Well, our experience has been that anything, any pickleball courts within 100 feet of residential land uses are almost guaranteed to draw noise complaints. Uh, and I have been involved with uh, several uh, legal actions uh, with pickleball courts uh, within that distance of 100 feet. What would the decibel levels be that someone would be experiencing at that closer range? Uh, with the ANSI standard, we are talking about an adjusted sound pressure level, uh, which accounts for the additional noise impact of the highly impulsive uh, sound characteristic. Uh, so that adjusted level is typically somewhere around 60 dBA at 100 feet for one pickleball cord. Okay, and we're talking about a much closer, how does it, does that change when you're talking about something that's only 55 feet away? Well, at half the distance, it will be about 60 feet louder. Okay, and is this a sound that would be experienced inside of the home in addition to outside of the home? Uh, most likely, courts this close, uh, it is very common to, uh, with clients that I've worked with, they say they can hear it inside their house. Uh, some have told me that it disrupts uh, Zoom meetings. They, if they're working from home, they have a difficult time uh, with conference calls and so forth because of the, the background noise. And is this a noise that can be mitigated in some way? I mean, at this proximity, would there be some way to be able to completely provide abatement for this type of a noise? Uh, unfortunately not at this distance. Uh, this has been somewhat codified already in the Park City, Utah pickleball amendment where they are requiring a minimum of 150 feet uh, setback from pickleball courts to residential land uses. And that that's typical. Uh, it's, it's a good working distance. In most cases, we can mitigate that. There are some exceptions. Uh, where topology plays a role and occasionally we can get a little closer than 150 feet but once you get within 100 feet it really is very difficult to mitigate this to an acceptable level. Um, is there anything else Lance that we haven't talked about today that you think would be important for the board to know? Okay, maybe you can describe a little bit about the difference between tennis and pickleball. I know, I know it's a <laughs> You know, it's often compared. Right. Yeah. Most of the uh, cases that I see uh, where someone is uh, filing a complaint against pickleball is when there is a tennis court that has been converted to pickleball and it is, it's in a location that is fine for tennis. The tennis court may have been in operation for decades. But as soon as they convert it to pickleball, there's a noise issue. And it's because the, there is a drastic difference between the sound output of a pickleball court versus tennis. Um, in your professional opinion, would the installation and use of this pickleball court in this location create a violation of the noise ordinance in Burlington, Vermont? Uh, I believe it would. Uh, the noise ordinance refers to reasonableness in I have seen a number of lawsuits over pickleball courts at distances even further than this, uh, you know, approaching 100 feet. And so it, 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 it does tend to be, um, people believe it is um, unreasonable. Is there anything else that you'd like to add that we haven't talked about tonight? Um, I believe we've covered most of it. It's, when it comes to citing pickleball courts, 
there are two factors that you have to consider. One is that the, the main method of noise abatement is going to be a sound wall. And a sound wall can give you so much um, attenuation of the sound, but there's a limit to what it can do. You must also have a sufficient setback to make up the difference in what the, the sound wall is able to accomplish. Okay. And in this instance, there's not even a sound wall that's been provided, correct? Um, I believe there is something on the drawings on on the west side. Um, I haven't looked at I haven't looked at that in detail. I don't believe there's anything on the east side. However, um, I have worked on a number of cases where uh, lawsuits have been filed, despite the fact that a fence cover has been installed going up to 10 feet and that was not sufficient to, to mitigate the sound. It is, is, as I said, once you get within 100 feet, it's just nearly impossible to mitigate this with a noise barrier. Any questions from the board for their expert at this point? Just checking. Okay. Um, let's let them finish their presentation and then. So I think in, in summation, I think the, the message here to this board is that if you permit this use in this particular location as drawn in these plans, you will inevitably be permitting a very, a violation, a very clear violation of your noise ordinance. And I think your code prohibits you very squarely from doing that. And so I think the concern here and the basis of the opposition, as Mr. Willis has made very clear, is that what you can't do is permit accessory uses in residential neighborhoods that are walking uh, the applicant directly into a lawsuit from their neighbors for violations of the noise ordinance. And, you're, and your folks in your zoning office are going to have to turn around almost immediately and cite these folks for a violation of the noise ordinance. And so essentially what we've done is bait them into a violation that uh, is, is ultimately going to have to result in the removal of the thing that we're permitting in and of itself. Um, and so that doesn't, you know, forgive me, but it doesn't seem to make a whole lot of common sense uh, at, at the end of the day. And I think that despite Attorney Roy's representation that you don't have anything in your regs to regulate this, I think you do. And I think you do for this very reason, because you don't want to permit stuff that you have to turn around and tell people to take out, right? Because it's violating the noise ordinance. It just defies logic. Um, so I, I think, you know, our that is the basis of our opposition. This is going to be incredibly noisy. It very squarely violates your noise ordinance. You've heard from the preeminent expert in the country that this is not something that is permissible. And at this distance, cannot, it just simply cannot be abated flat out. There's nothing that, that can be done here to mitigate this type of a, of a use in this location at all, period. And it's going to violate not only Ms. Farrow's uh, right to quiet enjoyment of her property, but it's going to do the same thing for all of the neighbors in this area. So appreciate your consideration and thank you for your time. Well, let's see if anybody has questions for you on this. I do have one question for, um, and I'm blanking out his name right now. Mr. Dr. Willis. Dr. Willis. Um, can you, how does this compare to like basketball dribbling on a asphalt court? Can you, is that, yeah, I, don't I don't have data uh, that I've analyzed for uh, ba uh, basketball. Uh, I, we do get contacted every once in a while about basketball, but it doesn't really seem to have the same level of intrusion that pickleball does, uh, just judging by the, the number of complaints that we see. And the Utah ordinance that you referred to, is that for uh, residential or commercial or any kind of uh, pickleball installation? Uh, sorry, I missed the first part of that. The, um, you mentioned an uh, ordinance was being drafted somewhere, and was that for a residential area or for, was it for a commercial area? Or what was the context of that ordinance that was being drafted? Oh, the Park City, Utah yeah. Code Amendment. Right, that one was passed in April of last year, and it, it, the purpose is to require setbacks for pickleball courts with regard to residential land uses. So I've actually, uh, Mr. Rubino, so I've, I've included that in your packet. You'll find it at the end of your packet. So you, you will find that the regulation says that a minimum setback of 600 feet from lot lines of adjacent residential property lines. So that is the standard in Park City, Utah. Now, 
then it says the planning commission may reduce the minimum setback to no less than 150 feet. So when the applicant submits a noise study, so you have to, have to actually do more, you can get this potential reduction. It can't under any circumstance be less than 150 feet. But in order to get that, you've got to submit a noise study by a certified professional, which demonstrates compliance with their code and their noise ordinances, approvals condition on the construction and completion of the noise mitigating features included in the noise study. So you'll get a recommendation from one of these experts, then you got to have the inclusion of these. So there, there's, you know, quite a lot of requirements that uh, Park City has implemented in considering something like this. But most importantly, as Dr. Willis has said, you can't get below 150 feet anyway under any circumstances, even if you do one of these noise studies. And here we're at 55 feet, which is less than half. Um, of what they've said is the absolute minimum. Have um, information on the lot sizes for Park City, Utah, the house lot sizes. I I do not, but I I respectfully I don't think it matters because what they're saying is it's 150 feet from. It matters if you have five acre lots or if you have city lots. It would well, matter. but if you're only 150 feet from the from the okay, residential land argue. use, I'm you know what argue I mean. With you on that one. Okay. Yeah. I just asked the question. That was it. I, I, I don't. I did okay. not provide that. I simply provided that portion of the regulation. Okay. If you'd like it, I'm sure I could find it. Um, any other, you have a lot of people here from the public. Does anybody else want to um, speak from the public, any of the neighbors? Yes. So I think my client would just like to. Okay, sure. Um, well, I have other stuff to add, but I did want to say that it's 55 feet from my property, but I think it's like 35 from the property on the other side. It's not even 55 it's closer so it's pretty outrageous um, while I'm here I'll just say that uh, I'm Bonnie Farrow I live on the west side right next door um, Sunset Cliff Road is within five miles of Burlington but it's a completely different world it's rural it's located there it's located at the end of a dirt road uh, houses line one side of the road there's the lake on one side and then a wooded wooded common land on the other um, it's a private dead-end road. It was originally designed as a seasonal camp community. So the lots are uh, irregular. They're small. Um, my house, for instance, is under a third of an acre. It's an unbuildable lot. And the only reason I got to build my house on it was because there was a seasonal camp on it. So it was grandfathered in or the footprint, whatever. And so um, it's a bucolic setting. There's deer going through our yards at all points. We drive past horses. There's community gardens. Um, but the lots are irregular and very small in size. And um, my house sits just six feet away from the property line of the Wong's house. Um, and five feet away from my neighbors over here, the Dudaks. We are cramped in, um, but we have the benefit of you know we look out our back and the lake is right there and we don't feel cramped but it is close quarters and they kind of arc around so there's a few houses that are maybe two or three houses away that are going to be facing this pickleball court and hearing I'm also hearing that um, the ones on the other side of the bay because of the lake are going to get the echo am I talking too loud for you mm -hmm. oh I thought so you're going like that okay. so they're going to you know fall victim to this as well so um it just seems kind of crazy to me to let this <laughs> pickle this person coming in have a pickleball court it's not a necessary feature of a home um we're not unreasonable these are some of my lovely neighbors you asked about a basketball court they're putting in a basketball court and it's even closer to my house and i'm not complaining i'm not like not in my backyard um <laughs> it's a different noise it's not the repetitive pop 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 a pickleball court is a quarter of the size of a tennis court. So it's not just a pop, pop, pop. It's a rapid fire pop, pop, pop. Um, anyway, I guess I just wanted to say I've lived there 12 years now. I've never had a noise problem with any neighbor there. I mean, there's short-term construction projects going on. That's to be expected. But a permanent pickleball court would forever change the neighborhood and take away, so I'm sure, send away the deer and make it just not the quiet environment that everybody moved out there to enjoy so um it's just it's a disruptive nuisance um it's just too much sound for too small a space basically 
And um, I guess I would just like for all of you to go online and Google pick a pickleball noise, <laughs> and you just won't believe what comes up there. And unfortunately, this is the first pickleball court coming to Burlington, but it may not be the last. And um, so I feel like this is probably a little early, and most of the people in this room had no idea how noisy and disruptive it is. Um, but I'd also like to say that I play pickleball, and I walk to community park, uh, to Apple Tree Park, and I play pickleball, and the courts are always available. Or I go to the Miller Center, and I can play inside, or I can get on my bike and go to Letty Park. It is just not a necessary thing to suddenly hold a whole ho a neighborhood hostage. You know, so that's somebody that's going to live here for five months and 29 days can enjoy, at the most, can enjoy a pickleball court. It just is not. Anyway, I just hope that you guys all Google pickleball noise and look at the materials and um, deny the permission of this pickleball court in such a small, closely clustered neighborhood. And that's all I have to say. Thank you. Yeah, you can just introduce yourself and. Everybody's just one. Everybody. They're all here for this. My name is Gail Anderson. I live at 82 Sunset Cliff, which is on the other side of Bonnie. And I'm uh, Dan Dudek. I live at 82 Sunset Cliff as well. And I think we're going to be about, we're going to definitely be less than 100 feet from the pickleball court. Um, first of all, I want to say when I first heard the Longs were going to put a pickleball court, I'm like, oh, that's great. Good for them. That was my first reaction. I played pickleball. That was my paddle <laughs> I brought as a demonstration. Um, so no problem with pickleball. Um, but then as I started learning about it and th finding out about this high-pitched sound, this relentless sound, and I got more informed, I went, oh my gosh, because we use our front yard, it's narrow as Bonnie's is, and that's kind of where theirs is going to be, in the front yard, you know, to play with our dog, we garden out there, we sit, you know, and, and have dinner by the lake quietly, uh, you know, we sit and read, we, we have, it's, it's a quiet place, it's a dead-end road, and um, <clears throat> it's a beautiful, serene spot with nature. Um, uh, and, you know, we, I also go over to Apple Tree Point with three other neighbors. All last summer, we went every Thursday to the tennis courts slash pickleball. They, they double as both. Never had a problem getting court there. So it's within walking distance or biking distance from our house, and it's even closer to the Wong, so they live even closer to the path that you take to go to the uh, pickleball courts. So um, I'm very concerned about it. I, I, I don't want to them to feel unwelcome or that we're not, you know, supportive of their project. Uh, they do have a small lot, as we, a lot of us do, and they're really putting an over 5,000 square foot house, pickleball court, and a basketball court. It just seems like the green space is just wiped out. Now, I don't know if that is anything relevant to you and, and how you feel about it, but um, uh, I just feel like it's just going to be a big change. We walk, people walk their dogs down our road. They come over from Apple Tree and they walk down. It's quiet. And I just am very concerned about it. I, I just, it's also a very high pitched sound. I'm a tennis player, have been for years. Still play tennis. We had a tennis court when we lived in Connecticut. We're aware of it. It's a very different sound. It's a, it's a high pitched, rapid fire bump, 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 bump. And it's just not appropriate in such a crammed in area. I just, I know it's, it sounds like, and I guess I have a question for you, is this the first pickleball court that's been applied for in a residential setting, like in a, an actual, on someone's property? I probably are in the public parks, I know they have them. Has anybody ever wanted yeah, to? had any issues with it so far, I don't think. Not that I know no. Has any been, been applied for anyone? So it's probably new to you too, because again, my first reaction was, oh, good for them, how fun, they're gonna have pickleball. I'm just gonna make a suggestion. Yes. Yes. We heard very eloquently from your attorney, from the expert. Okay. We have a lot of letters that neighbors have written. Okay. The fact that all these folks are here, and I'm going to assume that they're all sort of on the pickleballs, not in the character of the neighborhood side of things. Uh, we get the message quite clearly. Um, if And I don't know what else somebody would add to the conversation, but rather than just reiterating the issues that have been clarified so far. I've got, excuse me, not to, I have something else I want okay. to do. Online, I looked up 
a, uh, it was a pickleball website. I thought, well, let me see the other side of it. And there's an interview with a pickleball referee slash expert. And even he said that pickleball should not be put within 100 feet of, of, uh, of a residence. And, and he's a person that's and, and likened it to the decibel level of freeway traffic. Um, you know, and that's coming from someone that promotes pickleball, is a, is a referee. And, um, you know, he just, and it, quote, first of all, courts that are expected to be getting lots of use should not be located, located close to homes, exclamation point. So that's like another perspective. It's not a lawyer's thing. It's a pickleball person. And I also want to say that um, I know you've heard experts. I'm a human being. My husband and I bought our house two and a half years ago. We retired there. We're there to enjoy it. And we love our neighbor. We've had, you know, wonderful neighborhood. And this is more of the personal side of it. It'd be very, very distressing for us to have a pickleball court there. As lovely as the Wongs probably are, I've met them briefly. I have no nothing about that. But I just, I would be very disappointed if this was approved. And I'm just telling you the personal side of it. Anything to add, dear? Um, just <laughs> this this site. And I, I assume you've looked at site issues as well too. Um, is very wet. The entire area. Uh, literally, the common area on the other side is is a wetland. There's been standing water on the property um, all this all this spring. Uh, we can show you pictures if you'd like to see them uh, about that. I don't know what has been done about the compensation for the uh, impermeable surface that's going to be put on for the um, for the pickleball court or proposed for that. So that obviously is a concern consideration as well. Thank you. Thank you. Brad, the property owner is online and has raised her hand. If you let's at hear the, from the neighbors at the right time. Okay. first, and then. Hi, <coughs> Jeremy Grant. I'm an attorney at Kramer Piper Eggleston and Kramer, and I'm here on behalf of John Clark, who is the neighbor who is 35 feet away from the pickleball court. And I won't belabor um, the pickleball issue. I just want to make two quick points on that. First, under the city's ordinance. It's the applicant's burden to prove and demonstrate compliance with the nuisance regulations. And I think you've heard plenty of testimony about how noisy pickleball is, um, but I saw nothing in the application that, that met that standard. Um, second, a nuisance is a evaluation that takes into account community standards. And I think we've heard that this is a quiet community. You need to look at the setting where this is being put this isn't a, a neighborhood with a lot of noise. So in this neighborhood, it would certainly be a nuisance. Uh, the next point I just want to touch on is I think there is a issue with the lot coverage calculations. The DRB's report says this is a uh, 27,000 square foot lot. And I believe the applicants indicated that they would be adding 9,874 square feet of development and coverage. And uh, I'm not sure where the DRB um, calculations came in, but my math says that's 36.57%, so that would exceed the 35% lot coverage. Um, and unfortunately, I didn't see in any of the application materials anything that uh, segmented out how that calculation was made by the applicant. Um, so it was difficult to recreate, but based on uh, their own numbers, it shows that it would be over the 35% maximum lot coverage. Uh, and then the last issue I just want to bring up, um, which uh, was the initial concern of my clients, was, was the stairs that the initial plans showed that would extend onto their property. And I, I, I heard... Um, the architect's testimony in the beginning, but I, I still haven't heard that there will be no development that crosses over the boundary line and extends on to uh, the Clarks. It does seem to be the implication of the current plan that we have before us. Seems to be. Uh, and and I, I, I would just ask for clarification then um, okay. on that point. There's absolutely no development plan beyond the borders of the Let's state. not have a conversation going, though. Okay. Thank sure. you. Other neighbors that have anything else they want to add other than we we get a pretty clear picture of the neighborhood and the issues? I think you might have folks online also who are looking to speak, is my understanding. Yeah, we, no, we okay, have, got it. Okay. 
Who's yeah. the property owner is online? No, no, no. I think you also have neighbors online okay. as well. Yeah. My name is Evan Dick. I'm at 124. Yeah, go up here and speak. My name is Evan Dick. I'm at 124 Sunset Cliffs. We're just here. And it, first, I think a lot of us would regret that there would be a conflict between between existing folks and, and, and our new neighbors, the Wongs. Uh, but I think in this case, it's, it, it, as you said, we all understand that I'm saying, and we're just going to go on record as someone speaking because should there be a appeal. Uh, but I think, it, you know, imagine you got a, you got a loud barking dog. <laughs> you know, everyone can sort of relate to how that can sort of drive you a little batty. So I think it's in that, that sort of level of things and possibly worse. Mary? If people sign in, does that give them the ability to have status to appeal yeah. anything, or do they, uh, do they have to speak? Standing is different, but if they want to participate, they have to sign in and speak, yes. Okay. Okay. Were there neighbors also? I, 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 I only were. see one hand up online, and if you'd like to speak, and you're in on our online list, go ahead and raise your hand. I only see the property owner at present. Okay. And, um, it's my understanding that Marsha Hundley is online and she would like to speak from communication. She's online but has not raised her hand. Uh, are we technically doing hybrid meetings now, Mary? I didn't think we were. <clears throat> this was a request for this hearing. To be hybrid. To allow a Zoom option. Okay. okay. Um, so, who is it that you just mentioned? Marsha Hemley. Can you see her, Mary? I can see her. She's also provided something written that was posted. I think she's having trouble figuring out how to raise her hand, so maybe if we could unmute her and then she could just chime in if she wants to speak or not. Was that possible? I just. Can you hear me now? That's Marsha. Okay, Marsha. Um, I would need to swear you in if you're going to speak. Do you swear to tell the okay. truth, the whole truth, on the pain of penalty of perjury? Yes. Okay. And you submitted something. We've had a lot yes, of test. We've had a lot of testimony. So okay. we're. Really, I would just be repeating what I said, except for one other point, okay. which is kind of more a, a neighbor's point of view. It's so surprising to think that people would come into a new neighborhood disregarding what the, their neighbors feel is important for them to enjoy their property. Um, and in a much larger um, area of land, a much larger piece of land, I guess a pickleball court wouldn't have the same impact on neighbors. If I had five acres, then I could put up a Ferris wheel or something. But um, that's really all I want to say. I said what I wanted to, and I just want to preserve the right to be involved should this project unfortunately go further. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, I understand the property owners online. I want to bring them in right now. To, can can you bring her in, Mary? Yep. Yeah. Hi, it's uh, Lucy Wong. Okay, and Lucy, can can you hear me? Can you hear me, Lucy? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So I need to swear can you, you need. Me? Yes, I need to swear you in. Okay. You t swear to tell the whole truth and. Nothing but the truth under pain of penalty or perjury. Yes. Okay. I, I just have one comment. I had to laugh about the pickleball noise, but we live in the state of Florida, and I think they forget about Monica Sellis and Serena Williams being two of the biggest grunters on the tennis court. And we have a neighbor here with a pickleball court, and when we go there to play pickleball, there's a tennis court next to us. And there are four grown men at 8 a.m. every morning that their grunting outweighs any pickleball noise. I just wanted to fit that in because tennis is not always quiet. Okay. Thank you. And I just want to thank the neighbors for the warm welcome. Thank you. And all their kind comments. Okay. okay. Um, We've heard from the neighbors, and you get a chance to add your comments at this point. I, I just had a question about the um, the noise um, issue with pickleball. I understand it has to do specifically with the impact of the ball on the racket. 
that seems that's to what's be what being been the testimony that we've yeah. heard yes so I just wanted to say there are a whole lot of rackets out there and focusing specifically on a racket and a ball seems really silly when there's so many options um, so I, I just wanted, I, you know, I've done a lot of reading. Are you saying that actually as somebody who plays pickleball and knows the different rackets? Well, I ball played pickleball, pickleball, and I know that Lucy uses a racket that is specifically rated for as a quiet racket and um, did, did a bit of reading. I'm not an expert, obviously, but I just wanted to bring that up because I know that there are a lot of tools that you can use, and many of them have different sound ratings. Okay. Um, And can I ask a couple questions of Mr. Willis? Um, maybe. Um, can, it's sort of unusual to do that, but I guess he's their expert. Is, uh, Mr. Willis, are you still here? Is he still online? He's here. Yes, I'm here. I'd like to not have a lot of back and forth, so if you've got some very specific questions. Well, since I didn't see any of this until I got here, I haven't, it's not like I've had a chance to prepare any lengthy questions, so I'll be very brief. Um, Mr. Willis, have you ever been to the site? I, I'm going to, I'm only going to, I don't want to go through a legal jargon of back I, and no, forth. This will be very, so very. This is, no, if you have a specific question about his commentary on pickleball and, and status of that, that's one thing. But about the specific site, I don't think that's going to be uh, okay. Well, it goes. We would submit it goes to how well he can evaluate this application. We're not here to talk about pickleball across America. Right. We're here to talk about the Wong's application. So, assuming that he hasn't been here, uh, of all of the various lawsuits that you've been involved with, Mr. Willis, how many of those were uh, clubs or commercial? complexes that involved more than one pickleball court? Um, it's been a number of them. Do you recall one that was a single private court in a residential neighborhood? Yes. And where was that? Uh, Couple in California. And was it, I'm going to. I have a suggestion. I don't know if the board is going to be okay with this, but we've heard a lot of testimony. We have this, which we haven't seen yet. Um, I suspect that we actually might not deliberate tonight on this one. I'm thinking. Wait. And uh, I, since there's a lot of testimony, you haven't seen this. Um, we could leave the. Um, I have to remember how we do this, but we could leave the time to submit statements or testimony open so that we can get that before we deliberate. If you have comments you want to make up to rebut this report and stuff you've heard tonight, you'll have the opportunity to do that in, in that form. Okay, if, and if that's the case, yeah. then then I'm happy yeah, to, okay. to, to uh, um, so here. like I said, we have we've got a lot of testimony. I think we've got more than we can digest at this point. Um, Mary? Yes, sir. Do we if we want to um, at least leave it open to receive more testimony. Do we have to keep the hearing open? Keep the hearing open just to receive more submission documents. Over the next seven days. And then maybe we can deliberate. At your discretion. Yeah, and we could deliberate after our next meeting if we get that you're, information. You're leaving it open only to receive. Right. You're limiting it to receiving comments. Yes. Okay. comments. Do we have Tonight. a motion on that, Mary? I'm sorry, do we have to have a motion? Okay. So moved. So second. Chase seconds. Um, we haven't closed anything yet. All in favor? Discussion. We got four. You say yes. Okay. <laughs> so uh, you're burning to say something. I'm burning. I'm burning. Yeah. <laughs> As a tennis player and pickleball player, this is my paddle. Can you? Um, sure. You want me to come over here? Again? Well, you have sure. to speak at the okay. mic. Okay. Sure. It's just a quickie. I just wanted to. Two points. One is uh, to correct, and I don't remember your name, I'm sorry. There's never a, ne you never use a racket to play pickleball. It's a paddle, and okay. it's hard. There might be softer ones. Okay. It has to be clarified. We've got the testimony, and I think they have an opportunity. If they have something they want to 
clarify that there are soft pickable okay. paddles. But they then the other that. part of it that no one brought up is that, yes, half the time you're hitting, it's hitting the paddle. The other half the time it's hitting a cement court, which is also making sounds. You can't mitigate that. Okay. Second thing is I want to just say to the Wongs that I, there's nothing personal here. You know, we love our community, love our home. I don't want anybody to take offense. I want them to feel welcome, and, and I don't want ill will with anyone. So, okay, thank, thank you. you. So with that, we are leaving the um, hearing open for a week to receive testimony. People want to rebut what's been presented tonight or add more information. We have to receive it, and uh, with the goal of uh, deliberating after our next meeting and two weeks, um, assuming we're okay with everything we get. So with that, we are moving on. Yes. Thank you. Sorry. Lucky you. <laughs> well, that was fun. <laughs> I hear that? I must have missed that. No, I didn't hear that. Look to get some credit. I didn't hear that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Different, pickable. Oh, the lawn coverage. Well, cars don't make noise. Not everything that is um, construction is lot coverage in the same category. I figured you'd appreciate that question. Um, I figured you'd appreciate the question. For, um, open patios and front walks and things like that. So. I see, I see, I see. They always are. Sorry, I was trying to find. Don't worry about it. But you can bring that up. I feel bad for Brad. You didn't have it hard. <laughs> <laughs> he has no sympathy. No. No, uh, you got you got you got sorry, a, you got sorry. to wait on this one. Brad, would it be would it be us asking staff to double and so would that be a motion or No, it's a, just, the hearing still I the, the hearing I, I think you can still, still ask that okay. question. Okay, great. So uh, moving on to our next agenda item if the uh, pickleball team would uh, is done. The um, <laughs> That's everybody. That's quiet. Yeah, yeah, we'll be quick. You're, you're the, you're welcome. To, no, no, you're welcome to come join us. This is, yeah, you can tell the crowd this one's not going to take as long. Come on in. I'm assuming you're Rhino Foods. Yeah, you're more than welcome to join us here. This is, so our next agenda item is. ZP 2349, 21 Morse Place, uh, Riley Properties, and Silken Kirshner proposed construction of tenant parking, including six regular and one ADA parking spaces. Uh, we have the applicant here, correct? Yep. So, Kirshner, will you? Ah, will you raise your right hand? Do you swear? that the testimony you are about to give in the matter under consideration will be true and correct under the pains and penalties of perjury. Nice to meet you. And is there anyone else here to speak on this application? Well, that's what it appears to be. So this was actually marked on our cons uh, to be on our consent agenda item. And it, we never got around to it. I would propose that we treat this as a consent agenda item. It seems relatively simple and limited. It's a nice project. Um, any members of the board have any objection to that? No. No. Is there anyone online who wants to participate in That's this right. review? That's right. We have an online. If so, please raise your hand. Yeah, you should remind them that's a lot louder. Nobody? All right. So. Um, have you had a chance to look at the staff's findings? Yes, the staff report. Yeah, anything that you have an issue with that we need to address? Or everything okay? No, sir, everything good. Oh, please, never, sir. No one in your office would ever let that happen. <laughs> um, tell Jeremy you said that, he'll kill you. Uh, so I'll make a motion on ZP 23-4921 Morse Place that, since this was on a consent agenda item, that we approve the application and adopts staff's findings and recommendations. Second that. All those in favor? Thank you. <laughs> so there you go. The final item on our agenda is a sketch plan, ZSP 23-1179 Quinn City Park Road, Zoo Holdings LLC, Martin Corsell. 
Sketch plan review. Brad, are you recused? No? No, no. Oh, thank you. Uh, 65,000 square foot addition to existing Rhino Foods facility. We have the applicant here. Oh, sketch plan. We don't take, we don't swear people in for sketch plan review. We just, this is more informal. We look at the project and we give you some initial feedback. So, might as well introduce yourself, tell us about the project, tell us why you didn't bring any cookies, which I smell every morning on my run, and <laughs> see where it goes. I'm Martin Corsell with Champlain Consulting Engineers. I'll let Ted Castle answer the cookie question. <laughs> so, I'm Ted Castle from Rhino Foods, the uh, owner. Uh, we don't make any cookies is the real bummer, but we do make some baked brownies that we... That's what... Uh, yeah. we, we, we know we're not supposed to bribe public... <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> We appreciate you honoring that. But this we, is this is a joke. A no, no, do outside. not, do not, do not, do not. So, um, I'll be quick. You know, this is a, a big project for Rhino. We're excited about it. Um, we'll talk to you. We've really in the phase of trying to figure out uh, what we can do and what we can't do. Um, Martin will talk a lot about where we are and what we've done. Um, but Rhino is a privately held business. We have about 200, and, little over 200 employees now. Um, we hire a lot of new Americans, and we're very fortunate to be in Burlington. We want to stay in Burlington because we like uh, what we do here. We like the city of Burlington. We're on the bus route, which really helps us with our employee base. Um, we've grown over the years, and we basically make a lot of cookie dough and bakery products and inclusions that go into ice cream and have a 60% market share. So we're making lots of cookie dough for um, done a lot of different things to grow our business over time. Uh, we're a certified B Corporation. I don't know if you folks know much about that, but um, B Corps are uh, a group that you have to score over 80 points on assessment. Uh, business is a force for good around workers, uh, governance, environment, and community. So, you know, we've been very focused on um, not growth in our business, but more about doing right by business. That's really what is important to me and, and everybody that works at Rhino. So. Um, we really are excited to be here and show you what we've got going. This is a huge uh, project for Rhino. Um, we're a small business, we're privately held. We're not trying to bring in venture capital or sell our business. So this would be a way to really solidify what we have in Burlington. Um, unfortunately, we had bought the property between Rhino and Edland a number of years ago, maybe five years ago. So I'll stop there because can answer any questions you want about Rhino and our intentions. Love to answer them. Oh, I was just going. If you'd like, I'll give you a quick kind of overview of what the what the plan is, if that's what you're going to ask for. <laughs> okay. Um, so, uh, looking at the site plan, the north is to the right. Uh, you'll see that is the existing building uh, with existing parking. Again, to the right there, that's around 44,000 square feet. The uh, proposed expansion that we're looking at is around 65,000 square feet. It is that L-shaped building to the south. Um, on the, in front of the existing building, you'll see there's one curb cut with some parking in the front. Uh, that then wraps around uh, to the back. There's currently circulation around the entire site. Uh, what we're proposing is, will still be circulation around the entire site, so that existing curb cut will remain. Uh, that will be for employee uh, in and out and also for trucks in. So the plan would be that trucks would come in uh, that existing entrance, loop around the building. So you can see on the very south side, the southwest corner, uh, there will be 10 new uh, refrigerated loading dock spaces. And then those trucks would actually continue out to a new curb cut on the south end of the site. Mm -hmm. um, we are proposing uh, some parking modifications, as you can see, because part of where the new building is going to be, there is existing employee parking, so we are showing uh, a new parking lot. Uh, there will also be uh, new stormwater features, utility connections, and um, site grading involved with this. So that's a quick overview. Uh, if there's any questions, or I can jump into this kind of staff report and just go over a few items that might help. Um, it's up to the board. I. I I mean, I know, the, I know the site extremely well. I live right around the corner. Okay. And I run by it 250 days a year probably to get to Red Rock. So I know it very well. I know the ins and outs very well. You know, my, my first initial reaction to it was, you know, it's a great use for that property. Um, I had questions. You, you built that very nice stormwater pond out front. 
And so I was curious, is that going to remain? How are you modifying that at all, if at all? It's sort of in that corner where you're proposing to, you know, it's in that, it, it, I don't know if it's remaining, if it's getting modified. That was a question I had. Sure. Do you know what I'm talking about, the storm? Oh, yeah, yeah. So that was, um, yeah, I can certainly answer that. Uh, so the stormwater is going to end up um, getting changed. Okay. So uh, I do have, I, I, had, I, I had uploaded um, a rendering that actually showed. You know, and the reason I'm asking is, it, you know, part of the, the location of the parking, right? So, so one of the issues in the staff report is the parking goes out front. And the, yeah. the thought I had is, you know, when I go by it, uh, that pond grows in with some nice reeds and not like it's wildlife, but it, you know, you see stuff out there and it adds sort of a mitigating feature. So if you're going to put parking there, something that matches, I know there's a lot of reeds that grow in the ditch along the front, but something, m my initial reaction was, you know, I can understand why the need to put the parking out front exists, but, you know, it shouldn't just, you know, look like a parking lot dumped out front. I think, I think some mitigation along the way. Yep. Along Industrial Avenue would be beneficial. Yeah, so the um, stormwater basically set, when we submitted this sketch plan, uh, you can kind of see that oval along the bottom there. There's, can I go up to the board to kind of point if that might help? So I believe what you're talking about is the current pond is this shape right here. This is the four bay, yep. and this is the pond. So what we're proposing was it's one big pond here. Oh, okay. Yes. So that, that, this I, I didn't know bay. if that was a pond or a or we're, berm. We're proposing that. When we submitted so this, we're proposing that as a pond. Nope. Um, oh, since we've submitted, good. we've been working with Watershed Consulting to kind of fine tune the stormwater a little bit. Andres. Andres, yeah. exactly. So the current proposal is actually this will be a gravel wetland. There's also going to be a gravel wetland along the south side. Uh, in addition for stormwater, because this is now going to be a three acre site, uh, we're going to have to do some existing. Retrofit. Retrofit. So we're also proposing some bioretention along the here. green space in the front. I'm just shopping. Um, oh. So yes. Well, there, Thank this you. One. That's there. exactly the one. So this kind of shows. So this this rendering does show that would be the gravel yep. wetland. This would be the other gravel wetland. Um, very rudimentary. Okay. How do I get a pass? Rendering this? at this point. Um, but we are proposing, we're going to be working with a landscape architect uh, to have plantings on the side slope of that. This kind of, the way this is shown, does have, um, looks like standing water. There will be standing water immediately after storms, but it's not going to hold water all the time. Um, just that's how gravel wetlands function. So yeah, this, this does show that that would be the plan is, that's not a berm, that will be a gravel wetland, um, will be landscape there addition to bioretention somewhere along the, the green space up here uh, to deal with the stormwater. Um, and then you had kind of quickly touched on the, the need for the parking. There's really three main reasons that we're proposing the parking here. Since this is an expansion, we do need the new building to kind of flow with the production space that exists. So the manufacturing is kind of concentrated back here. So we need the, the product to all flow from that space to the new space to the loading docks. Um, and part of that also because Rhino, uh, they uh, produce a ready to eat food product, there's quite a bit of food safety involved. So really the employee entrance, all employees have to really enter at a controlled location. One employee entrance, which is the existing employee entrance. So if we were to say, could move things in the existing building but had the parking back in this location, um, those employees would have to walk kind of past all the truck docks. It'd be about 650 feet to all get to, to there. So um, those are kind of the, the big reasons why we're proposing the parking here. But, but you're right, we do have a, a feature. It's not just that we're parking right up to the edge of the road. Yeah, I think it's important that controlled would mean not like just a fob to enter the building. You know, everybody has to go into the locker room and get into a uniform and then leave their Crocs, put their self over the other side, put on boots. So it's a very controlled environment in our locker room. So the concept of the raw materials going into the production room and coming back out to the freezer is, is really critical. The, the people flow is like incredibly important and the production flow. So we actually looked at that. Um, we've 
hired a company out of Connecticut, Food Tech, to do the initial design of what's inside this building. But we're expanding, having the opportunity to do some more production if we grow, but also bringing our warehousing that we have a spot over at Vermont Commercial over in, in Williston. And, um, and also 3PL and Avon Mass, and that would, that would bring everything under one roof, which would make us much more efficient um, and hopefully have delight our customers by not raising prices every year as much as we are right now. Why is the south exit just a exit and not entrance and exit for the trucks? Because it's very difficult for a truck that turn and then come back out. If you're a truck driver, in order to back into that loading dock, you have to do what's called a blind side back. It's very difficult. And uh, in the current climate with trucking and transportation, there's a lot of clean and new drivers in, in the market. And uh, if you route the parking around, you have a better vantage point to not cause damage and to be able to get in there in a much more efficient manner. So uh, oh, sorry, go ahead, Leo. No, no, no. So uh, there, are, there are still loading docks on the north and and west side also. Yes. Yes. Okay. That's it, AJ. Oh, I was just trying to understand. So if it's easier if they circle around, come pull forward and then back straight up versus come in and then like K turn back in. Yeah. From one direction, you can see down your the side of your truck from the driver's side, and you can see as you're backing in. This is only a thought, a curious. Um, I suppose you'll have to talk to Public Works. I just wonder if it doesn't make sense to align the entrances and driveways with what's across the street at Burton. Um, I, I just I don't know if it does or doesn't, or if it's functionally impossible. It just. We talked about that because um, knowing that that would be something that is advisable, it just, as even look at that, you start to, you're saying like the idea, like try to creep that entrance north uh, so it aligns with we're that. We're south from yeah. the other one, but I. It's, it's sort of a, the maybe the site plan is better to look at. It's just sort of like we need, we're maximizing the space to be able to do what we need to do or it's not worth doing. And so um, I think it's a good suggestion. We just didn't know how to do it. And then, you know, that manage where's the building, where's the pond, where's the parking, where are the trucks? It just turned out to be like that, I guess is my answer. I don't know if that's the right answer. But. We had looked at it. Um, it would certainly reduce the amount of parking available just because of the additional kind of truck movements that would be needed as opposed to that kind of truck coming out straight. How many more trips, truck trips, do you think it would generate? Uh, the total number of trips uh, was between 11 and 31. Was the additional new trip ends? Yeah, between 11 and 31 additional peak hour trip ends. What's the peak hour for this? Uh, 6 a.m. I don't have that off the top of my head. Our first shift starts at 7. Yeah, that's the, that's, that's the switch hour. That's the switch over, right? Yeah. I mean, as you know, you know the place well. Like, we're, we're ferrying trucks back and forth all day long from the warehouse, bringing raw materials over. Is that why they're, is that why they're, is yeah. that what's a lot of those? Yeah, so we, we have a, we're renting, how much right now? 60,000 square feet at, at Vermont Commercial. So all of our raw materials are delivered there, and all of our finished goods are shipped out of there. So there's two trucks that are basically bringing raw materials over, coming around the building, getting finished goods that are frozen and taking them back. It's so in a way, it. you know, that it, it is this thing of like, if we weren't doing that, it would seem like, wow, there's a lot of additional truck traffic. But the numbers that we have, which we can get you, we have it all scaled down, but that's, that's the number. Yeah, and I think that's why there is um, kind of between 11 and 31, because I think the 11 is what we were proposing based on what Ted just said, and the 31 is more what the ITE would show. Solar panels? Pardon me? Are you planning to do solar panels on the roof? Well, right now we're working with folks about incentives and, you know, like we'd love to do solar panels. Yeah. Um, uh, quite frankly, this is now a $20 million 
addition right here, which is a big number for Rhino Foods. Um, so the things that we're looking at is uh, different, the refrigerant, thickness of the walls, um, solar panels, and so, so the cost of like every incremental difference. And we're working with um, Burlington Electric and talking to them and some other folks to try to help us figure out how to do it. it in the perfect world, it, we'd love to see it look like that. And access is basically Queen City Park Road to, it's really Industrial Avenue, isn't it, what you're on, or you're really on Queen City Park Road? I used, to used to be Industrial. Oh, they switched changed it. the name. They, they, Same they, road. Okay. I got to find the name. It's one of our old plans that gets very confusing. Yeah, I got a little confused yeah. by that. But that's, you can't, you can't use a Champlain Park where it doesn't get you any better access, does it? Uh, it term so it does. So the Champlain Parkway will have a traffic light exit at Home Avenue yeah. just on the other side of the railroad tracks mm -hmm. and then the one-lane bridge, right, that loops around. So we do, by, is that by Batchelder? Is that where the Champlain Parkway comes through there? Sort of. Yeah. Uh, yes, yeah. Okay. You can see it so, on side so right it now we do all of our... Um, over the bridge right now. We don't go down Flint Avenue, do we? No, I mean, it goes over the bridge. Yeah, we go over the bridge with everything right now. And I think the Champlain Parkway gives us an opportunity to. Is that correct? I mean, we actually haven't. The projects line up in similar times, yeah. as long as everything goes smoothly. So the Champlain Parkway would give you another ability to access not over the bridge. Correct. Correct. It would actually be better, be better for Burlington and better for us, I think, if that was finished, because we'd be getting off there and coming right in front of the bus station years, and be right there. Hey, they're working on it. You yeah. can go walk it right now. Yeah. Cut my drive from City Market down. Yeah. Probably a solid three minutes. <laughs> you know, I have pavement there, right? Um, and there will be a, a uh, bus stop? There is right now. So I would, um, I don't know how many, Matt or Garrett, you might know, but we have quite a few folks that take the bus right now. I find it funny there's a bus stop next What's to that? There's a bus stop? You are next to the depot. There's two. There's yeah, yeah. Right in front of the depot and but there's one. They stop right in front of Rhino. Yeah. This is the industrial area of Burlington, and I'm glad to see you. Yeah, that, nice that's like industrial use. Do you happening. do a wetlands? Do you have to do a wetlands delineation on that other property? Uh, there, w there was no wetlands on that. That was cleared. Yeah. Is the Wait. fence that goes across the back of the property? Is that a? Uh, it's a sort of a staggered thing is that a sound barrier yeah when we did the addition so it's hard to see but there's a small addition we did a 15,000 square foot addition um, five years ago and that was part of our um, plan there, there's houses right near near there there's about four houses and they're actually on a ridge so they're almost looking down at us so we did it for three reasons there was sort of the wildlife concern that's why the bridge is staggered. Yeah. Um, I think it's good for shielding, just the visuals, and then the final was for sound. For sound. Yeah. Do you think you need to extend that with the new, with trucks going in and out? And One of the things you can't see is there's a pretty big burn there. It, it's We were amazed there's 11 foot uh, elevation change from the corner to the, let's see, what am I saying, the south? North, north to the south. The southwest. So there'll be actually that slope will be up. So we, we don't think that we're going to need it. Yeah, I can see that. At yeah. least right now it isn't yeah. part of the, the plan. And the only other thing I would suggest is just a fair amount of parking there uh, to pay attention to the your landscaper when it comes to the requirements for shading in that lot. Yeah. yeah been in contact with them this week. and. This is sketch plan, so we didn't, you know, show all of the individual islands or the shade trees, but that certainly will be a big part of the design, and they will be working with us and with uh, Andres with the stormwater design, kind of the landscaping, the stormwater, and the site are all really co-mingled on this. To follow up, I would consider looking at where you have the old parking, you know, maybe adding some shade trees there and adding some landscaping there. Don't just look at it on the expansion side because then it'll sort of look unbalanced you know if you're going to put in some shade trees and some landscaping you might want to put it on the north side as well which isn't quite in your plan but you know i understand oh, the sketch a, we used to have some if you remember they all died remember that yeah i do actually there were some big trees and they all just died within three years i 
that's a big, yeah, get, that, that. You get a lot of runoff from the bus yeah. depot through that ditch. Yeah. It floods quite, it floods right down the street. May speak of using different species next time. Yeah, it was a, yeah, it was a different, <laughs> different. Yeah. But you did do that, I mean, there's a nice entrance to the building, it's fairly prominent. You know, I, I, I know we're not really necessarily commenting right now on the, the conceptual drawing, but, you know, I would consider doing something, you know, I would, doing something that, that isn't just a big block of gray. You know, I, I understand say, it's an industrial building, but, yeah, but adding something. I would something say just a, a, a comment, you know, we are a manufacturer and we are going to do everything we can to make sure that the people that come to Toronto are proud of the place they come and work. Yeah. And you folks are always welcome. That, that big glass thing is a, is a break room. It's gorgeous. It's beautiful. It's where everybody meets and gathers and sort of created a nice garden there. So, you know, we're all about trying to make it a place people want to come to work versus just a building that, you know, there's no windows and there's no light and you're just cranking away making cookie dough. So. It's a nice glass area. Do you have a glass sculpture in there? Do you have some sort of What's that? something hanging in yeah. the front? Yeah. Those are uh, our... Birds? Yeah, if, if, I know you probably all want to get home, but it's called the Crash Cafe. And I could bore you with, like, why is it called the Crash Cafe? I'm going to do this because it's sort of fun. Uh, why is it called the Crash Cafe? I don't know. Anyone? Okay, your hint is a flock of geese, a school of fish. A group of rhinos is called a crash. And those birds are the birds that warn rhinos for danger. So that's, that's sort of the theme inside that building. That's nice. There you go. Any yeah. further questions on sketch plan? No? I didn't see see a rhino someone anymore. with their hand up. AJ. Okay. Well, you're ready. do we take public comment during sketch plan? Why sure. Not? All right. Why Let's not? do it. Susan, are you interested in participating? And her hand is down. <laughs> okay. Well. I guess that's because she got her answer that maybe she wanted to know maybe why. She wanted maybe, to she knew what, maybe she, maybe she, she knew it was a crash of rhino. Crash so right. There it is. Thank Susan. you, Susan. Appreciate it. Susan, you may speak now if yes. you wish. Go yes. ahead. Okay, I'm going to hang up my phone because I'm to have to start. Um, hi, everybody. Hi, everybody. Um, so the, uh, to Rhino, I appreciate that you're a beef work and that you've been a good neighbor and that you've always engaged the neighborhood whenever you've been doing these expansions, and I really appreciate that. So as a neighbor, I'm in Red Rock, I just wanted to get a better sense of the impact on the neighborhood in terms of noise and lights and traffic. Um, you mentioned the possible change to a different refrigerant, and the refrigerant that you have makes this high-pitched piercing, squealing noise, and you've been really great at uh, trying to time that when it's not when everyone's sleeping. So I just wanted to hear you speak about a little bit first about the refrigerant. Yeah, so uh, let me clarify that. The, the noise you're talking about is the liquid nitrogen deliveries on those big tanks. So we're, yeah. not, we're not proposing any, any more of those. Um, when I talked about the refrigerant, I meant um, the freezer inside the new addition. So um, those will be, that, that's what I was referring to. You're entirely correct. The biggest challenge for us in working with the neighbors is when the uh, delivery comes with a truck of liquid nitrogen. And those, that will not change. Those tanks are still there and they're not moving to the other side of the building or anything like that. And they're not increasing in number. Um, this, no, so I would answer it this way, is the number of deliveries of liquid nitrogen is directly related to how much product we're making. So this project primarily is a warehouse. It does have room for expansion um, for more production space. Um, but again, that's really a, dictated by um, the growth of our business and the revenue, it's not necessarily dictated by this expansion, if that answers your question. Okay, yeah, so the, the 65,000 square foot is not for production mostly. It's for... I would say, 
getting right. it out to the trucks. I mean, we have two uh, areas that we have that will be sort of empty for future expansion, so we could put another line in there. But primarily, I, I would say 40,000 40, square feet is all warehouse that's either dry, refrigerated, or frozen. Okay. And how many truck bays are there now? There's only uh, three. And they're going up to 10. The reason is, is because uh, all our raw materials now are delivered over to Vermont Commercial Warehouse, and then we bring them over on our own trucks that you see those rhino trucks. We're bringing those back and forth all day long. Now, like if you said a, uh, a delivery of flour would come straight to this building versus going to the warehouse and then bringing it over here. So are you going to not have the secondary space and you're consolidating with this new addition? I mean, it's a, it's a fine question. I, I, I actually do think the applicant answered that. I mean, I think this is generally sketch plan, and these are important details to work out. Obviously, I would recommend, you know, before you reach out to the Ward 5 NPA and, and have a discussion with them, there's obviously some neighbors who have interest in this. Um, you know, the lights are important to, to consider. Um, as I asked about truck trips, there's a reason for that. Um, you know, I think... Susie brings up a good question about the, you know, are you going to add liquid nitrogen tanks and, and what impacts those will have? It is a constrained site to, as to the backyard. I mean, I know those houses. I actually looked at buying one of those houses, and you can definitely hear the rooftop equipment mechanical, and, and it's important to balance that out. Um, and again, this is sketch. Um, Rhino has been thinking about some of those things, so some of the uh, equipment is actually under the current iteration is proposed to be inside. It's actually be some mechanical inside that would usually be outside. It's a little more expensive, but that um, could produce a better project. There still may be some roof mounted. There may be some exterior. Um, everything will be screened appropriately, but we'll certainly take that you know, under advisement. Any more questions from the board? No, we look forward to seeing the full application. Yep. Great. All right. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you. Everybody. So that's our agenda for the evening.